Hello and welcome to the spiritguides.co.uk network radio show with your host Mark Chatterton. Today I would like to welcome back onto the show researcher and author Anthony Peake. Anthony is now the author of over 10 books covering the human mind, consciousness and their relationship to science. In fact, he is fast becoming one of the leading lights into the study of altered states of consciousness. His first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, has now sold in excess of 60,000 copies. His latest book, The Hidden Universe, An Investigation into Non-Human Intelligences, was published late last year, just before the coronavirus epidemic took hold. In it, Anthony looks at subjects such as alien abduction, religious visions, shamanism, imaginary childhood friends, ghosts, and a whole host of other intelligences, some of which we will talk about today. So a warm welcome to you, Anthony. Mark, wonderful to be talking to you. Right, let's um, just mention that I actually meant met you just under a year ago when you had the book launch at um, Watkins Books in Central London and it's been quite a year since then. Um, I know you should have gone to the United States this summer to speak at the Contact in the Desert event but obviously COVID-19 put pay to that. So what, what have you been doing with your time in the last year? Yeah it's been quite a frustrating year really all told because there were so many things I was supposed to be doing this year that never happened, like the contact in the desert. Um, I was delighted when I was asked to speak there, because interestingly enough, it's an event that I have no, haven't known about, but my sister and brother-in-law who live in Western Canada, um, originally from the world as I am, but they used to, they regularly every year used to go to this event. So we'd actually were planning a family get together as well. It takes place um, in Palm Springs, and you know you normally get about two or three thousand people turn up plus i was one of the keynote speakers so i was going to be on a platform discussing altered states of consciousness with people such as whitley streber and various other individuals but that never happened but fortunately i've now become a really good friend of the organizer and owner of the event uh, victor victoria de Gogan. um and i'm now keynote speaker next year um hopefully if it takes place i mean they're planning it to take place place in exactly the same location so we're hoping that we're going to make it an even more interesting event so fingers crossed it will happen but what i've been doing is over the last year i've been researching material for my forthcoming book um, and doing some various negotiations on that which we can discuss in due course um, but otherwise it's been just um more of the same really we're all in lockdown but it's also bringing out an awful lot of interesting ideas and thoughts in my mind about the status of, of human interaction human communication the things that the implications of the whole covid um epidemic as well in terms of altered states of consciousness and various other things so it's, it's exciting it's um it's a chapter it's one of those things we have to deal with after all there's no way we can escape from it yeah yeah i understand you did manage to get to greece though which is one of your favorite places and you you have got some greek translations of your books coming out there as well yeah, I'm delighted that um, it was quite, a, again, a really interesting story in that um, my, my publisher, Watkins, um, told me that um, a Greek publisher, uh, Cactus, was interested in my work and bringing my work out in Greek, which means effectively now that I have at least one book in all major European languages, um, plus, plus a few minor ones as well. So I was delighted about this. But because I love Greece and I've been going to Greece for over 45 years, sometimes once, sometimes twice a year. Um, I was so delighted that it was going to appear in my favourite country. Um, so when I had the opportunity to meet the publisher, uh, Yanis, who is an interesting guy himself in that um, he is a, a business person, but he inherited the publishing company from his uncle who died about 18 months ago. And his intentions are to change the whole feel of the publishing company without use, losing its academic credibility. And he was over in London on a business meeting in February and I met up with him for dinner and we got chatting and we realized we got on very well. And he's a really nice guy. And we, you know the way you meet somebody and just get on with them really well. And it was while we were having dinner that he said, what other books had I written? And I mentioned I'd written a book called Is There Life After Death? Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die. And he said, oh, I didn't know about this. And I told him about it. And literally the next day, he took himself off to Arctura as one of my other publishers and bought the rights. 
there and then. He happened to be in London and bought the rights for that book as well. So in fact, I have two books now due out in Greek. The, um, the uh, Hidden Universe book came out about a month ago and Is There Life After Death will be coming out probably in early spring. And the plan is if the lockdown isn't as bad and the COVID situation isn't bad, we're hoping to do an event um, in the cave of Vari um, outside Athens sometime though we're going to be recreating Plato's cave um, which is the old allegory of the cave that probably you'll know about and the guys out there will probably be aware of we can touch upon that if we want to later on um, but that could be really really interesting um, and we could have people coming from all over Europe because what we did was we did a similar event at Dracolo Caves or Dracolo Tunnels in Kidderminster uh, last April um, where we reproduced Plato's cave there in these incredible caves that they are absolutely unbelievable. Do you know of the caves of Dracolo? Yes, I've heard of them. Yeah, they 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 go on for miles. I understand they do. They they were fascinating because they were a, a shadow factory during the Second World War. And indeed, um, I I'm of the opinion that the bombing of Coventry that took place. You know, there was the seemingly strange bombing of Coventry that the Germans did. They were looking for a factory that they believed was in that area, and I believe this was the factory they were looking for because the Dracolo, Dra Dracolo tunnels were built 1939-1940. Um, there were old mine workings in this sand, sandstone outcrop um, for many years, millennia maybe. Um, but when they realised that it was almost totally bomb-proof, so they employed, the British government employed um, rover, rover cars in a total secret to literally tunnel into the hillside and build this shadow factory. And inside the shadow factory, there are five miles of tunnels. There are hospitals down there. There's a theatre. Uh, there is uh, canteens. There is a listening station. It's absolutely extraordinary. And um, after the war, um, it still wasn't declassified. It was still ultra secret. Um, and after the war, it became a bomb shelter, a nuclear bomb shelter, where Princess Anne was supposed to go. Princess Anne and her family ultimately were, were to go uh, because it's right on the confluence of a series of canals in the middle of England. So it was an ideal location that if all the motorways were bombed, she could still get there by using the canals. It's really intriguing. Hmm. Um, and I think it was declassified around about 10 years ago. Um, and an academic friend of mine has had access to the tunnels because they are highly haunted, extraordinarily haunted. And when you go there, you have this incredible sense of a presence it is extraordinary and there's poltergeist activity down there and everything else as well which is very intriguing but what we did was myself um, a group of academics and my austrian friends with the lucid light device we we did an event and we had 20 people paying guests who were put into altered states of consciousness using the lucid light device um, and also virtual they were given virtual reality headsets to put them into an altered state and while they were in this altered state, we then introduced them to um, uh, the, the whole concept of Plato's cave, the idea that the, the old myth is Plato suggested, imagine a scenario that there are a group of people who from the moment of the pain in the back of the cave, and literally they cannot move their heads and all they can look is at the cave, the back, back of the cave, and behind them, is a huge roaring fire and between the fire and them there is a walkway and people walk along the walkway with cardboard cutouts of animals and everything else which then reflect onto the back of the cave wall so effectively these individuals they believe that the, the all of reality is literally the shadows on the back of the cave they, they that's all their perceptions tell them and what happens is the myth goes or the allegory goes that one day one of the, the prisoners manages to break his shackles turns around, sees the roaring fire and the cardboard cuts out shadows, walks past that to the entrance to the cave to see the reality we live in, then walks back into the cave and tells the other prisoners and said, hey guys, you know, what you believe is real is not, it's shadows on a cave wall. There's a much bigger reality out there. And of course, they, just, they don't believe him. They call him, a madman, they call him crazy and everything else. And this is effectively what I argue takes place when people have altered states of consciousness, when they have near-death experiences, out-of-the-body experiences, when they take hallucinogenic substances such as dimethyltryptamine, or they have encounters with entities. The rest of us, neurotypicals, or people who 
are literally thinking that the shadows on the wall are reality, we diss them. We turn around and say, no, you're crazy. And this is the whole point of the whole of Plato's cave, the idea that this is a mind-created hallucination in exactly the same way as any other hallucination is. And there is a reality behind this reality. And this is what I deal with in my latest book, uh, The Hidden Universe. Right, that's handy because that brings us into it now. Um, I'm just... I'm just getting a copy of the book just to show people that's what it looks like. Um, You start off the book by looking at shamanism and the notion of egregorials. Uh, This is a theme which is found throughout the book. Could you explain a little bit about what you understand by egregorials? Yeah, fascinating, fascinating concept. The word egregor and egregorial comes from Greek and it means watcher. And the original egregorials and the original watchers um, are entities that appear in um, the book of Enoch, which is one of the books of the Bible that didn't appear eventually in the canon of, of the Christian Bible or in the Jewish Bible. And when you read the book of Enoch, you realize why both the Jewish people and the, the, uh, the, the Christian people decided it was just a bit too strange. Because the Book of Enoch describes um, a group of entities that come down from space, come down from the sky. And they come down in a place called Mount Hermon, which is on the Israeli-Lebanon border now. And they come down and these entities see human women and they find human women attractive. And they, 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 they breed with human women and they create what in the Bible was called there were giants in in those times. And these are the creatures they they create. Now, these beings were known as the watchers. Uh, And as I say, the term watcher in Greek is egregore. Now, if you start to then look more deeply into the book of Enoch, you find some quite interesting things about it. For instance, it it is fairly evident that these entities are similar to the Anunnaki that you had in Sumerian legend, the people that came down and taught the Sumerians medicine taught them engineering and taught them other things and again these entities were not human and again in the sumerian legend it is evident that these these creatures were not what we think they were they weren't gods they were they were gods that came out of the sky now again it is i find it absolutely extraordinarily fascinating that there's only one um christian group that's considered the book of enoch to be within the canon of their their teachings and that is two religions the the the, um the people in ethiopia the ethiopian church and also the eritrean christian church as well and both these groups have the book of enoch within their canon and it is written in a very interesting language Um, and i'm trying to think what it is now it's not it's not modern ethiopian um, it'll come to me what the term is for the language. But it's again intriguing because mystics for centuries have been quite fascinated by this book. And indeed, some of you may be aware of the work of a guy called John Dee, yeah. who was an English magician who worked with a guy called Edmund Kelly. And Kelly and Dee were very much working on the Book of Enoch to create entities, to draw these beings in from somewhere else. Uh, and this is where the term Enochian magic comes in, because there's a term called Enochian magic that the, that the magicians use. And it is, again, drawing these entities in. And, of course, Enochian magic then became the magic that Alistair Crowley used when he was trying to create entities and what I call egregores. And this very much is to do with the central core of the book, is to what are these entities? Are they just forms of imagination? Or are they something greater? Are they, do they link with other phenomenon and entities that people encounter in altered states of consciousness? And I believe they are. Right. Connected with that is the idea of aliens and UFOs and alien, a, alien abductions. Um, in the book, you mention that in the USA um, and that side of the Atlantic, the consensus of opinion is that these are actually physical realities that happen, whereas in Europe, generally speaking, these are seen more as a, a mental 
a reality. Could you explain how this view has come into being? Yes, yeah, excellent question. What has taken place over the years, there seems to be two kind of parallel um, interests and analysis, analyses made of the uh, encounter phenomenon and what UFOs actually are. Now in America, there has always been the idea that they are physical, that they are physical things that fly, that fly through space and come to Earth, and inside they have aliens, basically. Um, this is not a, an issue particularly, but there are some interesting things about the UFO phenomenon that questions that. Because, for instance, UFOs seem to culturally track. They seem to be directly related in some way to our expectations of what they're going to be. And to give an example of this, in the 1890s, there was a very famous UFO flap um, where Americans were seeing airships across America. And the, the inhabitants of the airships would interface with, with people in America. And when asked who they were, they said the, usually they were Germans or French. And on top of that, um, they, they seemed to be very human looking. You know, they, they were alien in the sense to an American living in Wichita. Probably somebody from Germany would be feel alien in the sense that they weren't, were, weren't from America. So therefore there was the feeling of the other taking place. But then as we move through the century, as we move through the years, we then get to the Keith Arnold incident in 1947 at Mount Rainier, when he sees the flying saucers skipping across because it's interesting how he described them, why they became called flying saucers was because Keith Arnold described them as being like um, stones that you skip across um, uh, a, a pond, you know, and you throw a, surf, a stone and it skips. And that's how he described the UFOs that he saw over Mount Rainier as flying. So they became known as flying saucers, but it was more his descriptor of it. But these seem to be then sort of, again, we were in the period where the Cold War was starting. There was the fear of the Russians. There was the fear of, of everything else. Then Sputnik goes up in 1957 or whatever. And suddenly we're interested then in spaceships. And of course, by that time, the whole science fiction uh, pulp magazines were out. You know, Philip K. Dick was writing about it, various other writers. Um, and it came clear that there was an image in people's minds of what aliens would look like. And the aliens at that time were what I think is generally called, they'd either be monsters, they'd be bug-eyed monsters, or they'd be Nordics, you know, these all blonde beings who were here to save us. So we had the 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 a the nasty aliens who are here to kill us and do awful things. You know the whole H. G. Wells stuff, and of course we had the H. G. Wells thing, the Orson Wells thing taking place in the nineteen fifties as well. Plus we had the fear of, of of everything else as well, and the Russians and nuclear annihilation. And then we had the aliens turning around and the Nordics saying, "We're here to save you. We're your, we're your space brothers." And there were a load of religious cults that started up at that time. So there seemed to be something in the collective unconscious that was driving this. Rather than them being nuts and bolts machines, there seems to be something more going on. And this is what stimulated Carl Jung to write a very famous book of flying saucers, The Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. And of course, he was talking about deep-rooted beliefs that we have, the idea, you know, that there are... There are symbols that go through history that are sublimated within us, that we see within, within things, archetypes. And he argues that these archetypes are part of our own subconscious that we project outwards into the external reality. Now, the Americans continued with this, but Ian started to like this idea of something more mystical, something to do with, with, with elves and fairies and everything else that sort of go back into history. And a lot of writers, particularly a, a, a writer called Jacques Vallée, who argued in his book, Passport to Magonia, that these entities have always been with us and they, they morph and they change dependent upon our expectations. And his book, Passport to Magonia, for instance, it particularly relates to an event that took place in the 12th century in France, when a uh, aliens seemed to come down and the, the local yokels, the local peasants, 
asked them where they were from, and they were said they were from a place called Magonia. And put the book Passport to Magonia is very much referencing this historical aspect, because there does seem, and I, I talk about this a lot in the book, that there seems to be an awful lot of parallels between encounters with aliens and darkness and caves and the elves and the spirits of the, of the land. I mean, for instance, in Irish tradition, you have people called the Tudor Danon, who were the people who were, were, were in Ireland before proper human beings were there. And the Tudor de Danon, the, the, gentle, the, the gentle folk, when they disappeared, they disappeared into the hillsides. They disappeared into the hills around Ireland and used to come out of the hills to, to interface with human beings. Now, again, uh, there was a very famous Scottish writer, a Scottish um, uh, vicar, who used the term um, the, 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 the hidden commonwealth. And again, we have this idea of these, these beings that live tooth in jowl with us all the time. And they come and they abduct children, you know, because again, you have these whole legends of people being abducted by the little folk and to be taken somewhere else. And in modern day times, you have the phenomenon, the Betty and Barney Hill examples and everything else, where you have people who are taken by the aliens and the aliens then do all kinds of weird and wonderful things with them you know they 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 examine them and they do all these things and my argument here is that i cannot believe that if they are so advanced as they are why they feel the necessity to have to be doing very crude operations on hicks from the middle of america why why do they need to do this surely if they're that advanced once you've opened up a human being, you know what's inside them. Our doctors have been doing this for years. They know what's inside. But the aliens don't seem to know that. They seem to continue doing it. So whatever they are doing, there's something much deeper in terms of this. And in the book, I draw parallels between that myth or that experience that people have with something called shamanic traveling. And a shaman, when a shaman is inducted into being a shaman, one of the things they need to do is to be taken up into the upper world where beings will work with them. But the beings have to dismember them in order for them to become shamans. And the shamans go through this awful initiation ceremony in their minds, whereby they're eviscerated. And they need to be eviscerated to be reborn again as a shaman. But you then look at the parallels between that and UFO encounters and UFO abductions, and they're extraordinarily similar. You know, the similarities are striking. But the question has to be, and the question still has to continue, that there is physical evidence of UFOs. When UFOs crash or when UFOs are seen, there seems to be indentations in the ground. There seems to be some kind of physical presence. So in the book, I argue that it is a bit of both. Because modern quantum physics tells us, and this comes back again to the point I was making about Plato's cave and the analogy of the cave of Plato, that we know from neurology that what we perceive as external reality is not. We believe that what our senses tell us about external reality through our eyes and our ears and everything else is a one-to-one -one facsimile of what's out there, and it isn't. People who believe that role are known by um, neurologists and known by consciousness studies people to be naive realists. And it's to be naive to realize that that's the case. Because a moment's reflection will tell you that that's not the case. And I'll give a very quick example. You're looking around now, you're seeing the visual world. And you think that that's what's out there. Well, what is actually taking place is quite interesting and quite intriguing. Because what's happening is um, photons, you know, particles of electromagnetic energy that we see as light are coming down from a light source, the sun or the moon or, or a light source within a room or through this window. And what they're doing is they're bouncing off physical objects and the photons then bounce off the physical object and carry a message. Enter your eye through your pupil then they go through the, what's called the aqueous humor, which is the, the, the gelatinous mass inside the eye, to hit the place at the back of the eye called the retina. Now, the retina is postage stamp sized and bent because it's at the back of the eye, so it, it's bent like the back of the eye. It also 
um, is inverted because what happens is when the when the photons hit, they are converted from um, electromagnetic energy into an electron electric signal, and that signal is then converted into a neurochemicals, which then transfer that image from the back of the retina along the um, the optic chiasma in the optic nerve, which then splits and then moves to the back of the head, the darkest part of the brain, called the visual cortex. That signal is then reconstituted by the brain into the image that you see that you think is external reality. Now that image that is when it's transferred is post, get this, is postage stamp size and inverted. From that small image, the brain creates this huge surrounding you image okay that's all around you it's it's colorful it's in three dimensions and everything else that's all created from a postage stamp inverted image so clearly whatever it's doing it's creating it's adding to the image from its own expectations and there's a very simple way of proving this it's something called the blind spot now the blind spot is on both eyes at the back, where the optic nerve that I was talking about at the other side of the retina, when it leaves the back of the eye, there is an area on the retina that is not sensitive to light, which means that everybody has a blind spot in both eyes. Now, I remember discussing this with um, an optician when they were testing my eyes, and I said to him, and I said, isn't it extraordinary how we don't see the blind spot? The brain fills in the information of what it thinks is there to give us a, a permanent viewpoint and he turned around to me and this is all serious he turned around to me and he said no no that's nonsense that's nonsense he said you know as we were taught and you know it he said the blind spot disappears because we have stereoscopic vision so both eyes are looking at things from a slightly different angle and the image is like a pair of binoculars they overlap and they give us stereo vision and i said to him oh that's fascinating and i said so why don't i see the blind spot when i close my eye and you know this guy said and he said my God, do you know, I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never thought of that. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is how people do not think through. They, they're taught things and they just believe them. And he said, yes, of course, you should see the blind spot. And I said, no, you, yeah, because you don't, because the brain fills it in, in. So if the brain can fill in a large part of your visual image that you're seeing, why can't it fill in the whole lot? Why can it not recreate internally whatever it wants you to see? And that brings in then the then massive spin-off from this is in modern quantum physics, we know that the act of measurement or the act of observation of a sentient being or a measuring device changes subatomic particles from being a statistical wave function whereby they can be anywhere, but that they do not exist. They just exist as a statistical mathematical function max born came up with this but the moment they are observed or measured the potential wave where the wave of statistical chance of an object being found in one place or another collapses into a point particle being located in a particular space and time the argument is the act of consciousness does that so that means out there is even more mysterious because it's actually been created by your senses, by your act of observation. And we all are observing the outside world and collectively our observations create what is externally out there. And I call that the egregorial, the reality, the consensual reality that we all consensually bring into existence by our anticipations and our hopes and our fears. So in which case then, the egregore, egregores within this suddenly are not just figments of our imagination. Suddenly there are things that could have independence of us that could be drawn in from somewhere else within the multiverse. And this is the point of the book and the point of the hidden universe. Right. Um Obviously, connected with that is um, religious visions, and obviously, a, a m large gathering of people all see the same thing. Could you explain how how that sort of fits in with your book and, and so on? Yeah, this is um, 
you know, from my background, you know, I have a degree in sociology, and one of the things I worked on was was the sociology of religion, the sociology of belief, but also the sociology of language and the sociology of perception. And it is quite fascinating, and it has always intrigued me as to why it is that certain religious groups believe fervently things, and other religious groups who have totally different belief systems also believe in them fervently. But it seems that everything in their world reinforces their beliefs. It's as if the collective anticipation of what reality really is supports their beliefs. Whereas myself, as, 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 as an agnostic, um, I don't see these things. I don't see the proofs there at all. Whereas I have religious friends who say, how can you not see the way the world is? And that intrudes me. And again, it comes back to something called the safer wolf hypothesis, which is about language, the way in which our language structures the way we see reality. The way you use words structures the reality. The way in which our verb forms work structures our understanding of reality. So there is an idea that, that reality is more molded by our anticipations than we first believe. Now, this means religious people see things in quite a different way. Now, there is, for instance, um, in one of my books, I, I write extensively about something called Gershwin syndrome. And Gershwin syndrome is hyper-religiosity. It's individuals who... Um, uh, suffer from in Ray's commas temporal lobe epilepsy, where they see links in things that neurotypicals don't. But it doesn't mean their linkages are wrong. It just means we as neurotypicals don't see them. Uh, for instance, the, there has been a lot of research on this in terms of how religious people, their world is different um, and how they can seem, their very beliefs seem to be able to change the reality around them. And is this what is taking place when people see Marian visions? When people go to Lourdes, because we know people get cured and they go, how does that work? Super placebo effect. But it knows, it does happen. So the question is, can these people, because their religious beliefs are so powerful, they can physically fix themselves and cure themselves of things like faith healers, okay? But it's the issue of when people see things like the Virgin Mary, you know, when the children in Fatima in 1915, I think it was the three children, saw the Blessed Virgin Mary, the BVM, there was never any stage, and I go into great detail about this, that this entity ever said it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. The believers imbued into that that it was the Virgin Mary, but it never said that. It was a lady. And I started researching back, and the cave that the lady, lady was seen in has been known for centuries as a place where egregores can be seen. It was always known as the cave of the lady. So obviously there was some entity that was there that was being created by the anticipations of the people around. And again, it morphs. You know, I was talking about UFOs, track belief systems. In olden times, it would have been a, a, a fertility goddess. And then it changes to being the Blessed Virgin Mary. Today, we could have maybe seen it as being a, a, a UFO person, an entity from a UFO. And it's what we anticipate that comes in. Now, again, I will give an example of just how curious this is, because I think this links in to a neurological thing called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, and Charles Bonnet syndrome was discovered by a guy, extraordinarily enough, called Charles Bonnet. I always find it extremely interesting how these people discover things that are named after them. Um, I've been facetious, obviously. Um, Charles Bonnet, he, he was a guy in the 18th century in Switzerland who, um, whose uncle, Charles Lullin, was starting to see things. And Lullin described how he'd see beautiful ladies in his bedroom and have beautiful coats and hats and everything else. And they weren't there. They, or they weren't real in the sense of how we understand real to be. But, but uh, Bonnet was interested in this and discovered that this was something that happened to a lot of elderly people when they get older, they see things. Now, this is my own mother. Um, and again, probably coming from Merseyside, you'll probably know the locations I'm talking about here. But um, my mother phoned me up one evening and she said something quite curious happened. Um, we, I was walking onto Bromcool Village with your, with your aunt. Uh, both both ladies widowed many years ago, became friends with my dad's sister and my mother. And my mother is partially sighted. She lost her eye with malignant melanoma. And the other one she was developing um, glaucoma in. So she's partially sighted. 
She said that my aunt stopped to tie her shoelace. And when she stopped, my mother looked over my aunt and looked over Unikina, which is an old factory next to the village where I was brought up. And she said she saw what she described as being a smoke ring. And she said the smoke ring started to move around, started to swirl, and then suddenly shot off towards North Wales. And this appeared. My mother then phoned me. She said, what did I see? And I said, I really don't know. Maybe it was something to do with your eyesight that you saw. And she said, no, but it seemed to be out there in reality. And it traveled. Now, as a caveat to this story, I subsequently discovered when I posted this on my blog site that there was a friend of mine, um, her Morrigan, who was traveling on a bus going along the A41 Newchester Road near Port Sunlight. And she saw this object. She was there on that day. And she said, no, I saw that object. We all saw it on the bus. So there was something physically out in reality that my mother had seen. Now, just to also explain, my mother knows nothing about UFOs. She's not interested in them. She, nothing. She doesn't like science fiction. She, she's a very grounded lady, or she was. She then phones me up two days later in a state of absolute fear. And she said she woke up in the middle of the night and she couldn't move. Now, clearly, I'm aware of what she was. She was in a state of sleep paralysis. But she said, my head was turned towards the bedroom door and the bedroom door was open. And she said, I live on my own. I normally close the bedroom door, but it was open. And I thought, that's curious. And then she said, as I looked at the door, suddenly three spindly fingers came around the edge of the door and this little being popped its head round. And my mother's description was quite precise. She said it had huge black eyes it had two holes for a nose and a slit for a mouth and long spindly fingers. And it looked at me, blinked, realized I was conscious and dodged back. She said it saw me. It was aware of me. This wasn't a dream. This was something out there. What did I see? And I said, Mom, you, you were dreaming. You were dreaming. And I explained sleep paralysis and put her mind at rest. But clearly she'd seen something extraordinary. She'd seen a grey. She had seen the grey that is on the front cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be on stage with Whitley Strieber next year in California, talking about these incidents and talking about his experiences that he writes about in Communion. Strieber, by the way, is really intrigued by this model. A lot of people are. They think that, you know, this had legs. This, this, this really is, is, is hitting something quite interesting. So what did she say? Well, in the book, in the book's introduction, I discussed the fact that these entities, again, egregores, that I would, as I would call them, have been seen for millennia. In 2017, in northern India, they found a group of caves that people had not lived in for 10,000 years. They got into the caves and there were cave paintings. And the cave paintings show exactly what my mother saw. 10,000 years ago, people were painting these creatures on the cave walls. In the Junction Shelter in South Africa, in the Drakensberg Mountains, there are also cave paintings that show the same entities. The same entities have been found in caves in Europe. Clearly, at different times in the past, people were drawing the same things. Now, the counter argument is used here is said, yeah, of course, they were drawing people. It's just that they were so crude in what they could draw that they didn't, they didn't have the skill to depict normal human beings rubbish they certainly know how to paint bison and horses <laughs> the last cow caves the, the art in there is perfect they were painting what they were seeing and they were seeing greys so the question now is what are these beings are they real are they part of us or they're not they are part of us but they're also something outside of ourselves now, I think they are entities that probably may be created by our anticipations out of plasma, another form of matter that has been comparatively recently discovered, and they seem to draw themselves through. And the reason I make this point is that um, I was fascinated by reading a lot of the old Sufi texts, you know, the Sufis of the mystic order of Islam. And in their writings, they discuss the creation of the jinn, entities, the jinn. And the jinn were created, this sends shivers up my spine every time I, I say this, were created out of what is described in the Quran as smokeless fire. Smokeless fire is plasma. Okay. So the question is, 
do these beans pull it through? Now, one of my friends is a guy called Paul Eno, who's a top American researcher into hauntings. Now, he has seen ghosts many times. He's seen entities many, many times. He is convinced that these entities are made out of plasma. The way they move, the way they, 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 they seem to come out of smoke or seem to come out of light, white light. They seem to draw in the energies. And he believes that they are, in some way, parasites. And that they feed off fear. Their nutrition is fear. So therefore, by engineering fear in people, they get nutrition. Okay? And it helps them draw themselves into this reality. The question is then, where are they coming from? Well, I believe, and again, if you read ancient texts and, uh, and everything else from all the major religions and everything else, there is this liminal area. There are two worlds. There's the world of this reality, and then there's a reality behind this reality. And between the two realities is this liminal place where entities exist and they can be drawn through from one to the other. And I use the term, this reality I call the, um, the Kenoma. The Kenoma is from the Gnostic Christian belief systems and the Kabbalah and the Sufi belief systems. All the three Abrahamic religions, their mystical groups, all have the same model of this kind of liminal place. And this is where these beings exist, and they can draw in from here into this reality. Um, this is the, the kenoma, the mind for the place where we exist in, which we are trapped within this perceptual universe, this perceptual reality that's created by our brains and the collapse of the wave function. It's a simulation. We exist within some form of holographic simulation. The entities exist in another form of the hologram, in another part of the program, but they need to have us to help them pull through into this part of the program. Okay. Now, again, using the Matrix at the movie as a classic example, Agent Smith is an egregorial. They're egregores. They're, they're, they're kind of semi-sentient programs that, that can come into existence in one way or another. The reality behind this reality, I call, I, well, I don't call, I'm using terms that have been used for centuries, call it the pleroma. Pleroma is Greek, again, and it means fullness. It's the reality behind this reality. Now, right through history, there's been this belief from the, the Manichaeans to the Gnostics to the Cathars that we are trapped within this illusionary world and this illusionary world is something that's trapped we're trapped within and again uh, the very famous gnostic poet william blake called it the mind forged forged manacles in one of his poems the american science fiction writer philip k dick called it the black iron prison it's the prison it's what in the matrix they call the desert of the real it's again coming down to postmodernism. We've got Bralad, we've got lots of French philosophers who talk about this. This idea that in some way we collectively are creating this simulation that we exist within. And can we break out of this simulation? And does it mean that our collective anticipations create things, egregores within the world? Is this what COVID is? COVID is something we are creating. Mm. from our collective fears, anticipations, whatever we want to call it. It seems to be that we anticipate things and they come into existence. In one of my next books, um, the, probably my next third next book, I want to write a book on quantum physics and, and not only quantum physics, but also um, general physics in the way in which it seems that subatomic particles come into existence because we anticipate them. Not only does it mean we collapse the wave function, I'd also argue that scientists themselves, by wanting things to be found, discover them. I'll give a classic example of this. The muon was a totally hypothetical particle. They didn't know, they just thought, well, this is, seems to be, there should be a particle here somewhere. But they couldn't find it. And then one day, loads of scientists are looking for it and it pops into existence. 
E. E. Rabi, who was a, uh, a quantum physicist and a Nobel Prize winner, when they found the muon, his actual comment was, who ordered that? They want to find the Higgs boson. They find it. They wanted to find, you know, for instance, in 1900, Max Planck, the, 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 the German physicist, was desperately trying to understand the enigma of black body radiation in absolute desperation. And he said it was an act of desperation. He thought of a number and plugged it into his, 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 um, his calculations. And it's called the Planck number. This made it work. And suddenly he said, maybe energy doesn't, isn't continue, comes in little packages or quanta. This act of desperation in 1900 created a whole quantum revolution. And in December 1900, he made this speech and he said, I don't believe for one minute what I'm suggesting is true, but this seems to be the case. Five years later, Einstein comes along with relativity and suddenly the whole worldview changes. It's as if we had been thinking about this and suddenly it happens. The Planck constant, the Planck number, the Planck constant is now found everywhere. It's found everywhere that scientists look, it's there. Now, people again never think about this, but why is it that the maths that we think about, that we create by our mind, algebraic functions, geometric, well, geometrics is a bit different, but algebraic functions, number theory, imaginary numbers, how is it that the things that we think about in terms of mathematics can explain how a black hole works? Billions of light years away, an object that no longer exists and hasn't existed for billions of years, our mass can explain. You know, it's as if there is the numbers is what's behind all this. Everything is digital. Everything is numbers. Everything is zero or one. It seems that it's a mathematical universe. And indeed, quite recently, the Swedish-American um, Quantum physicist Max Tegmark wrote a book called On Mathematical Universe, making exactly the same points I'm making. That math seems to be at the point of it. And the more and more we're discovering and drilling in, it's almost again like the matrix where you see the green creatures and you get closer into them and it's binary code. It's as if everything is binary. And if it's binary, this means that we're hacking into the simulation. Information is the basic. You know, people say, is it mind or matter? What became first, mind or matter? Is the matter physically out there? Whereas mind is something that's amorphous that is sort of in our heads. Well, neither of them are right. You go down further and what do you get? You get mathematics. You get digital information. And again, I'm using the term information quite precisely because it's a reference to Dr. Uh, Professor David Bohm who was a quantum physicist who came up with this concept of what he called the implicate and explicate orders, that everything is enfolded in itself. Everything is a mathematical structure that our consciousness creates out of the digits and ones we create, just like your computer takes the digits and ones on your CD-ROM that you load in and you load it and on your screen, you get a virtual reality that you can walk within. Of course, again, you know, we now know with virtual reality headsets, we can see what seems to be a three-dimensional reality that we can move within, we can interact with, we can interface with. But it's not, it's two-dimensional digits. It's two-dimensional data. But we can make it experience as if it's a real experience. And I think this is now why we're starting to come to the final point of really understanding what reality really is. There is something called the holographic model of reality. More and more scientists are coming down this route to suggest that everything is digital, everything is mathematical, and everything we see and everything we feel and everything we hear, everything is mind created out of information. And again, the, there are people doing the research of this. There's a guy called Juan Maldacana, who I think is Argentinian, and there was a recent guy that died recently called Jacob, Jacob Beckenstein, who was a top quantum physicist, and now a top young up and coming quantum physicist called Black Vadrell. All these guys are arguing that 
we exist in a flat holographic two-dimensional universe that our brains convert into a three-dimensional reality and not only that they do the maths of it they actually say that the whole of the expanded universe inside like you know the universe big bang it moves outwards it's like a huge balloon being expanded outwards they argued on the inner side of the expanding balloon that is the universe there are points points called Planck squares and each one of these Planck squares holds one digit one qubit of information a quantum digit and each one of these is firing in information inside the expanding universe to create this three-dimensional illusion again this is not quantum this is not supposition this is not woo woo nonsense i'm talking to you about here if you want the woo -woo answers lots of other writers out there that can give you as much woo woo as you want i don't this is where they are going with science at the moment and again just look up one well the look up craig hogan at the perimeter institute in canada in ontario they're doing they're trying to discover the digitization of space or digitization of space time this is the most exciting developments that are taking place now and it all ties in with my egregorial hypothesis right that's quite a lot to take in there um what about the idea of synchronicity because i know on your facebook page you've mentioned synchronicity happening to you quite often and um how does that tie in with with them um, this idea of what what you've been talking about with with the um uh, the quantum world and so on synchronicity is a fascinating subject and again let's make a direct link between quantum physics and synchrony i will talk about wolfgang pauli now wolfgang pauli was the guy that came up with Pauli's exclusion principle, which um, I will go into details in one about Pauli's exclusion principle, but it probably in terms of this, but it, it's it's the idea of how uh, certain electrons can only sit in certain shells within the inside of the, the atom. But Pauli was also fascinated by other things. He was fascinated by synchronicities. He was also a very strange character. There was something called the Pauli effect, um, and this is really true. Pauli apparently, whenever he was in um, uh, experimental environments, nothing would function. Things would break. They break down, and they used to. The scientists used to say to Pauli, "Look, go out of the room. You know, it'll not work if you're here." As we <laughs> had last time when we tried to do this program, it's the Pauli principle, and they got to the point where he wasn't allowed anywhere near anyone. And there was one case many years ago where um, a group of scientists were working on some experiment. And everything stopped working in the in the in the lab, and they said, "God, bloody hell!" And Pauli isn't even here at the moment. So a couple of days later, they 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 contacted Pauli and said, "You know, it's really weird, but because uh, he was living in a different city miles away, so it was really weird." And Pauli went and said, "Yeah, um, yeah, I was travelling on a train through your city, and when it went wrong, I was on the train sitting at the platform about two miles from where your your place was. So he was there." So even at a distance, he was able to make things not work. And these things fascinated him to such an extent that he became interested in synchronicities. And he approached um, uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, the psychoanalyst, because Jung was interested in synchronicity, the same Jung that wrote the book about UFOs, you know, flying saucers and not myths in the sky. Because a lot of my work is very, very Jungian, and I'm very interested in the applications of Jung and archetypes and everything else. Yeah. And... Um, what then happened was the two of them worked together and they wrote a book on synchronicity and on synchronicities and they called it the a causal principle the idea that seemingly unrelated things can be linked together in a significant way and in my life they happen so much you know to say that these are coincidences a synchronicity is not a coincidence it has to have significance and it has to be rooted there was a guy called camera who was an austrian mathematician who looked come out with something called the law of seriality whereby you get a lot of these things coming together and there's normally a joke there's normally something that you don't see initially that suddenly it'll come to you and you'll go oh god yeah i see that now it's the cosmic joker you know the amount of times that synchronicities happen to me and i wait for it and i think okay where's the joke coming where's the joke coming uh -huh. and then it'll happen yeah you know suddenly you'll you'll realize why the synchronicities have happened because there will be another synchronicity makes something else now i think synchronicities again are evidence that 
we can manipulate our external reality. But in many ways, it's almost feedback. We are anticipating something in some way, or the, the simulation is trying to tell us something. The simulation is trying to warn us, or trying to say you're on the right track, or just have a joke with us. And I think this is what is taking place. Um, you know, on my website and everything else, and in my writings, I discuss synchronicities you would not believe. You know, um, synchronicities about dates and times and places um, that you go, how on earth did that happen? I mean, I'll give one example. Um, I was um, doing research. And again, this proves my hypothesis, which I call the Damon Adelon dyad. I believe that this is a simulation. And not only that, but it's a simulation of your life and a simulation that you've lived, you've lived this simulation many times, like a computer game. You live this. We've had this conversation many, many times. This is why we can recognize things. This is why deja vu takes place. It's because we've done it before. We know, just like the game player knows when they've played Lara Croft 10 or 15 times, knows what's going to happen when they go into this particular room. It's because you've done it before. You know, deja vu is exactly what it feels like. It's nothing to do with the neural pathways in the brain getting confused. It isn't. It's rubbish. It's simply to do with what it feels like doing. You've done this before. As um, the uh, most famous researcher on deja vu, um, Vernon Nepe, uh, stated, he's a, he's a, a psychiatrist at, um, at, in Seattle, and he wrote a book on deja vu many years ago, and he is the general def definition of deja vu, is that it is a recognition, it is a recognition of a set of circumstances that you've experienced at some indeterminate time in your past, but you don't know when. You just know that I've done this before, and there's an argument that it's a dream. You've, you've had a precognitive dream recently, and you're remembering it from that, or simply you're remembering it from your last life. But it's going back again. So synchronicities, are, I'd argue, are part of all that. They're part of the, the simulation. They're things that are there to give you clues. And I'll give an example. Um, many years ago, um, when I was researching my first book, I was needing, it's unfortunate we're not in our, our library, in my library downstairs, because I could show you the book in question. Do you want me to go and get it? Because I can do that if you want. No, you're, no, you're all right, I think. Yeah. yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, leave okay. it, yeah. But I can show you the, the, the book yeah. in question. But it was quite fascinating because I was researching mit mitochondria, which are um, organelles inside the cells of, 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 of creatures, really, um, mammals. And the, the, DNA, the DNA within um, uh, the mitochondria is quite curious because it's a different kind of DNA to the rest of the body. Um, and it is mitochondrial DNA goes through the female line as well. So it's quite an interesting thing. And I was quite intrigued by this. And I was, I was reading, I was writing up about it. And I thought, what, which writer that I know will have written about mitochondria? And I thought, yeah, of course, Richard Dawkins. Now, you may not believe it, but I've got all of Richard Dawkins' books. I'm a huge admirer of Richard Dawkins. I think very similarly to Richard Dawkins. I'm a skeptic like Richard Dawkins. I just think Richard Dawkins goes too far sometimes in his criticism. And by the way, there is a mutual friend of mine called Dr. David Parry, who's trying to get Richard Dawkins and I to do an event together, because he knows both of us. So that could be a very yeah, yeah. interesting thing of mine. That's an aside. Um, so I go to my bookcase, and I've got all their books, and I thought the, the one he's probably going to write about is The Blind Watchmaker. So I go to The Blind Watchmaker, pull it out, and one thing I never do, I never, I never dog ear pages of books. I, my books are really important to me. I don't damage them in any way. I try not to break the spines. And, quite strange individual, I suppose, in terms of that. I look at the book and I, I'm astonished because I see there's one page in the whole book that's dog-eared. And I thought, bloody hell, when would I have done that? And I then suddenly remembered, and it was like a flashback. I remembered being on a Greek beach on the Greek island of Simi about 20 years before. And I remember reading the book and it came back like an image to me. And I remember reading the book and thinking, oh, I want to go to lunch now. And I dog-eared the page of the book. For some reason, went up and had, had coffee. Didn't think anything about it. Came back again, sat on the beach, finished the book. 20 years later, I see the book and I go, and my daemon, my inner self, myself, my game player, the person that's lived my life many times before, just says to me, ha ha, watch this. 
I've done this for you. And I thought, oh, I can't believe this. I opened the page, and in the page was the reference to mitochondria. I then thought, oh, well, Richard Dawkins must write about mitochondria a lot. So I went to the back. It's the only page he mentions mitochondria. Not only that, it's the only page in all of his books he mentions mitochondria. So my earlier self had given it, it had given me a clue. It said, you're going to like this. I'm going to make this as a coincidence, a synchronicity, and it's going to prove your theory that you've lived this life before. Because I know, and I know in the future that you're going to find this, so I'm going to give it to you. Astonishing. Now, that if that was a standalone story, I'd say probably coincidence. I have story after story after story. I have dozens of examples like that, all of which relate to me writing my books. So my earlier self, my higher self, my daemon, has been guiding me to do this since I was a child. Ever since I first started interested in UFOs way back in the mid when I picked up, picked up Brad Steiger, I think Brad Steiger's book, Flying Saucers Are Hostile. And again, there was a beautiful, beautiful turnaround to that story because um, a few years ago I was contacted by Brad Steiger and we swapped a lot of emails and had chats on stuff. Like, you know, and again, being able to do that is just really wonderful that you can speak to your heroes and things. But the goes to show that if you start looking for these things, now the, sin, the, the skeptics will argue, they'll, they'll cite something called confirmation bias or attention bias. As soon as you start looking for coincidences and synchronicities, you will find them. They will use the argument, there are so many things in your life that you know about, that you deal with, that you read about, so many people you know, that statistically the chances of these things happening are extremely high. Yeah, coincidences are extremely high. Synchronicities, where they're rooted or not, you can't argue that that do do dog-eared page was just a coincidence. You know, you can't apply that. Mm. I wasn't looking for it in that way. You know, it, it doesn't work in that way. But that's what they'll argue. But I think there's much more significance to that. And I think as soon as you start attuning to these things, you'll see them everywhere. And I think it's your daemon then guiding you, your own daemon, your game player saying, I've got your attention now. Because I think sometimes these things are there to catch your attention. It's like the 11-11 phenomenon. Um, people talk about this. They see 11-11 everywhere. I'd argue you see 11-11 there all the time for one simple reason. There are the, the, the four verticals. And... We are programmed as creatures that lived on the plains of Africa, that anything that sticks up in any way is a threat, so we'll see them. And I used this argument for years until my wife one day turned around and said, and this is again another synchronistic, she turned around and she said, you're not seeing the obvious here. And I said, why? And she said, you go on and write about 11.11 and you dismiss it as a phenomenon. I can show you something that will prove the 11.11 phenomenon in your life is nothing to do with uh, coincidence and everything else and attention. And I said, what then? And she said, what's the title of the Dutch language edition of your book? And I went, oh, I don't believe this. It's called 11, 11, 11. <laughs> 11, 11, 11 in Dutch is life after life after life. Now, how absolutely bloody unbelievable is that? <laughs> I write, you live your life again and again and again. I'm seeing 11, 11 everywhere. And in Dutch, 11, 11 means life after life. And you couldn't, you couldn't put that into no. a story. Mm. They wouldn't believe you. They wouldn't believe you, would they? Mm. No, no. <laughs> well, it's been a, a fascinating hour. We've just got time for one more question because obviously you're very excited about your next book, which is going to be due for publication in 2022. Um, but you've got a whole year where you're going to be writing it, researching it, and so on. Could you just give us a little um, taste of what that's going to be about? Yeah. By all means, one of the one of the most frustrating things that happened to me when I was writing my first book, Life After Death, was that that's not what I wanted to call it at all. But I was so excited at getting a publisher's deal, and they were paying me, giving me advance, and everything else. So they were in the position as publishers to decide what the cover looked like uh, and what it's called. And I wanted to call it Cheating the Ferryman. Um, and we'll come into what I mean by that in a second. But they, they said, no, we think that people won't get that. It's too clever. 
we need to call it something that people will immediately understand what you mean. Um, so we're going to call it Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die. I got quite irritated by that because the book doesn't discuss what happens when we die. I discuss what happens before we die. I never make opinions about what happens after we die. So that was wrong. So a lot of people bought that book thinking it was going to be about after death, and it's not. So that hacked people off. Also, it's not the extraordinary science of what happens when we die either. It's the extraordinary science of what happens before we die. So that was wrong. And it annoyed me. Uh, but I had to live with it. And the book, you know, sold really well. By the way, the book is going to be, that book is coming out again early next year with a complete new cover. And I'm going to be writing a new introduction to it and everything together with also The Labyrinth of Time, which is one of my other books that will be coming out and also The Damon, A Guide to Your Extraordinary Secrets itself. So they're being relaunched, all of them, and re we dazzled up again by my publishers, which is really great. But my publisher, there's a new um, uh, director, editorial director there, and the older people have moved away. And the young guys that I first work with, the young graduates 20 years ago that I worked with for the book, are now the directors of the company. Um, and they're very keen on my work. And they're saying, look, you know, they approached me a couple of months ago and they said, you know, we really want you to do the book you really wanted to do, which was Cheating and the Ferryman. Um, we'll give you an advance and everything else, we'll give you the time to do it and we will call it Cheating and the Ferryman. And I said, brilliant. They said, what we want you to do is to take all of the ideas you had in the first book and revisit them with the science you now know, with the, the last 20 years, all the things you've researched, all the people you've interfaced with, all the famous people you've interviewed and talked to, and all the new science that's been discovered subsequent to when I wrote the first book in 1999-2000. And they said, let's do that. We'll give you carte blanche, you do it. They haven't even asked for a synopsis of the book. They have just said, you know, you can do it, you can just do it. So the new book will be this, it will be revisiting all of the things that I discussed in the first book, but it will there'll be nothing repeated. All the science will be new, all the research will be new, and all of the examples will be new. Because now I'm in the position, I have, what, nearly 11,000 people following me on Facebook. So literally, I can go to 11,000 people, and with their friends and friends of friends, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people. And I'm going to say, look, if you've had any experiences that reinforce my hypothesis of cheating the ferryman, which I'll come to later, um, write to me, let me know. And I may, may or may not publish, but I will publish as many of them as I can in terms of the new book. So there'll be lots of new experiences, lots of new anecdotes, lots of really interesting stories. The human interest is going to be there. So this is really exciting. And today, breaking news today, is that um, the foreword, uh, I wanted somebody to write the foreword and he's agreed. And the person who's going to write the foreword is Professor Jeffrey Kripal, who's the Rice um, Professor of religious history at the unit rice university in in uh, in texas now jeff Capel is one of the most extraordinary writers i love his work although he's a very very rigorous academic has a great reputation as an academic he's also one of us he loves comic books his book um is it monsters and mystics something like that and it's a review of mysticism in in pulp fiction and comics you know from everything from Watchmen to you know it's just it's brilliant it's a brilliant book but he's written a series of books all of which are extraordinary and today he said and said he would be honored to write forward to the book so that's really great because that's yes. going to really open up the book massively to America because he's huge huge in the States and a wonderful guy to boot yeah. So that's what the new book will be about, and it's going to be about cheating the phone. And cheating the phone is finally the idea I've mentioned a few times that we live our lives over and over again. And what I suggest is that when we die, we don't really die. We cheat the ferryman. Ferryman, the caron, comes through the mists. You're supposed to pay him your coin. He takes you across the river sticks to the underworld. You never pay him. You cheat him. You cheat the ferryman. And that's what the book and concept is all about. 
Right. Well, we'd look forward to that. When, um, no doubt we'll hopefully be able to interview you again in a year or so's time. But um, thank you ever so much for agreeing to this interview, Anthony. And I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in, in your present book, the, the Hidden Universe, and they can buy that from your website, as in fact, you can buy all, all your books from anthonypeak.com. And thank you again for doing this interview. You can, you can buy it, or you can get it off Amazon. You can get it um, on bookshops. Just go into your bookshops. Some of them are still on the shelves in the bookshops. Um, do them there. Uh, they're also on Kindle. Also, my first three books are now also on Audible uh, with me reading them. Um, sadly, I couldn't convince Watkins to allow me to read The Hidden Universe, but that will be coming out in Audible in a few months' time as well uh, with an actor pretending to be me, I guess. <laughs> I just wonder. Um, but uh, one of those things. So that will be available on Audible as well. So they're there on multiple platforms. Um, check them out. Uh, they're in your libraries as well. You don't even have to buy them. You go yeah, to your library, yeah. but, uh, you can order them. Either they'll be on the shelves, and if you can't, you can just order them. But, uh, you don't even right. have to buy them. It'd be great if you could buy them. I'll buy them off my website as well because <laughs> I earn more money from that. But yeah. you don't have to. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you ever so much, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Walt.